Okay, so again, what I want to do is um, walk through and review just sort of the diagrams that we used to talk about relationships so far. And so we talked about how the history of salvation we can kind of see on this timeline. And I will put it up on the computer. Project. Man, my computer, this is what happens. Okay. So we have this timeline of salvation history. God created the world. Everything was good. Then something happened called original sin. Things became distorted, right? Which means we can still tell what it is. It's just not clear. And then Jesus enters into this distorted world in order to bring clarity so that we can grow in virtue and eventually we get to heaven. Right? That's the story of salvation. It's the story of our lives. It's the story of your students' lives. And we talked up until this point about this time period between creation and the fall when everything was good. And when we talked about the image of God, we said that the image of God is the image of the Trinity, and we can draw the Trinity sort of with these three circles, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This relationship of love called fatherhood is characterized by wanting the good for the other. This relationship of love called sonship is characterized by the words to entrust one's self to the other. The Holy Spirit is the fruitfulness or the bond of love between them. Pope Benedict says, you know, the Father is a being for, the Son being from, and the Holy Spirit being with. The real God is by his very nature entirely being for, being from, and being with. Man, for his part, is God's image. Precisely insofar as the from, with, and for constitute the fundamental anthropological pattern. And what we've seen up until this point is that in the beginning, when God created Adam, Adam experienced himself in this relationship with God as a son. So God wants the good for him. Adam entrusts himself to God. right, And everything was good. Then God said, it's not good for the man to be alone because he can only love as a son. He can't yet love as a husband or a father. And so he brings him the woman. And so we have Adam, the man, who encounters the woman. He's now able to love her the way God loved him. He wants the good for her. He also entrusts himself to her. She entrusts herself to him and also wants the good for him. And so now they each can love as a son and daughter and a husband and wife. And when that love is expressed in the most complete, profound, and bodily way, this third person comes forth. Right? Yesterday we reflected on those words of Eve. Right? I have a child with the help of the Lord. You know, and so we can see that that pattern, the anthropological pattern, was followed through the Genesis chapter 2 narrative. And then today we're going to talk about what happens in original sin. In original sin, the temptation presented, the primary temptation, this is just in very simple terms, is the temptation to doubt the fact that God wants the good for me. If I doubt God wants the good for me, I can't entrust myself to him, because there's an order of love. I have to know that I'm loved in order to trust. I have to know that I'm loved in order to trust. And that was true biblically. It's true theologically. It's also true relationally. It's true in our own lives. Right? It's true in our own lives. If we feel like we don't trust somebody, it's probably because we don't believe they actually care about us. Right? That means if somebody doesn't trust me, it's probably because they don't really believe I care about them. You know, if your students seem like students who don't trust anybody, it's probably because they don't really believe that somebody cares about them. And so when somebody's struggling to make the act of faith, when somebody's struggling with faith, the thing that needs to be told to them over and over again is 
the fact that God loves them. It is the fact that God loves them. You know, sometimes Pope Francis is criticized because of the way that he interacts with sinful people, or the way he talks about sinful people. But if we really want to convert those people, they have to know that we love them, and they have to know that we love them even if they're a sinner, because that's the first step towards conversion. Right? It's the first step towards conversion. If we simply begin with the fact that you're a sinner and I'm not going to interact with you until you change your ways, then we're not communicating the fact that you're lovable even though you're a sinner. Right? We're not following St. Paul's example in the way that he proclaimed the gospel when he says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that temptation that happened at the beginning, that temptation to doubt the fact that God wants the good for us, you know, it's presented in Genesis 2 with the serpent who goes to Eve, and she said, he says, did God really tell you that you're not allowed to eat from any of the fruit of the trees in the garden? Right? Because the evil one always exaggerates. Right? He always exaggerates the truth. And he always makes seem, things seem way worse than they actually are. Right? And that same temptation exists now. Right? Your students say to you, you never let me do anything. Right? You don't let me do anything. When parents try to set parental controls on their kids' devices, the kids are like, you won't let me have anything. Right? No, it's not that I'm not going to let you have anything. I'm just not going to let you have this thing because it'll kill you. Because it'll do damage to you. And my job is to protect you. Right? My job is to protect you because I love you. And so... Did he really tell you you can't eat from any of the fruit of the trees of the garden? No, he didn't say that. He said we just can't eat from that one fruit or even touch it or we'll die. And then the evil one comes back and says, if you eat that fruit, you will not die. You'll become like God. And God doesn't want you to be like him. Right? So what's interesting in this temptation is that the devil is presenting something like you can be like God, but they're already like God. So it's almost as if he's saying, you can be like God and you don't even need God to be like God. You can be like God all by yourself. Right? You can be like God all by yourself. And that again is those words of the evil one resonate in our minds when we say things like, I can do it all by myself. Right? Sometimes I ask a teacher, How's your relationship with the other teacher that teaches your same grade? Oh, I don't know what they do. I, can, I, I know what I'm doing. I can do it all by myself. Or whether parishes choose to use the diocesan offices to help them with their activities, right? And now we can do it by ourselves. Or like my grandfather, who's just moved to the care center at the place where he lives in Phoenix, and he is fighting everybody because he thinks he can still live in his apartment, even though he's 92 years old and he falls out of bed and he can't get up, but he can still do it all by himself because his biggest fear is to be dependent, right? Our biggest fear is to be dependent, but reflecting back on the beginning, what did we discover? We're created to be dependent, right? We're created to be dependent. And so if I doubt that God wants the good for me and I think he just wants to keep me down and he doesn't want me to flourish, then I can't entrust myself to him. And I end up declaring my autonomy from him. I'm going to do it all by myself. And it ruptures that relationship. And so the first thing in the order of love that gets distorted by the devil is our identity as sons and daughters. Right? Our identity as sons and daughters. You know, in the world of spiritual warfare, what does the devil want to attack? He wants to attack our identity. He wants to distort our identity. Most of the wounds that people have that put them in therapy with a counselor are identity wounds. It's when something is distorted, their identity. And so then the Holy Spirit is evicted from their hearts. There's this void in their hearts. Now Adam is walking around with this void in his heart. Eve is walking around with this void in, his, in her heart. And they're going to try to fill it, find out how do I fill up the void. 
with that relationship with God because original unity is rooted in original solitude, that our relationships as spouses or as friends or our communion is rooted in first, that first communion with God, the distortion is going to carry through. So if God's not trustworthy, I'm not going to think this woman's trustworthy either, but maybe seek to fill the void in my heart with her, to turn her into an object that can fill up what's missing in my life. If God's not trustworthy, neither is he, but maybe he can fill up the void in my life. And that relationship becomes ruptured. So the second relationship that gets ruptured by sin is that spousal relationship. And then it kind of bleeds into that third relationship or the being for relationship. Because when there's a rupture between a husband and wife, the temptation's always presented to try to fill the void again with a child. And so this woman can't fill the space that's left in my heart. I still feel like something's missing, but maybe this child can fill up the space in my heart. Or this man can't fill up the space in my heart. I feel like something's missing, so maybe this child can fill up the space in my heart. Right? And that relationship becomes ruptured or distorted. And so the distortion that we'll see as we walk through original sin follows the anthropological order pointed out by Pope Benedict. Right, which means the healing process or the conversion process also is going to follow the same order. That if we want to address these distortions in love and distortions in relationship that happen between men and women or between parents and children, we have to go back to the restoration of our identity as sons and daughters first. Right, the restoration of our sons and daughters first. Right, two kids who are fighting with each other need to have their own ad- dignity affirmed. And we're not going to solve like the core problem if we just simply like give them rules for relating to each other. We have to do that too. But at the same time, we have to go back to affirming our identity as sons and daughters of God. Right? And providing every what was missing from the beginning. Okay? And we'll talk about that as we get to redemption. One of the things, so while we're making this transition, I want to reflect a little bit about um, some, just some supporting knowledge from the psychological sciences. Right? Because all of this theology that we're learning, it's also verified by neuroscience, and it's verified by a psychological theory called attachment theory. Right? And attachment theory... Uh, I write it on the board. Right. Attachment has a specific meaning when we talk about it from a psychological perspective. Right? Like sometimes we just want to use it for any kind of relationship, but it really means the ability to entrust oneself to another person. Right? That's what it means. If we were going to put a definition on it, we can use the same definition we use for being a son or a daughter, the ability to entrust myself to another. And this theory is posited by a psychologist named John Bowlby, if any of you want to do additional reading. John Bowlby, who also worked with um, another psychologist named Ainsworth. And so what Bowlby did was he was looking at how Freud essentially was looking at people's lives and analyzing them um, according to the behaviors they have now. And Freud came up with this theory that all of this has to do with our sex drive, right? And so everything in Freud has to do with sex. And we kind of know that association, and some of you are making faces right now to show, like, the way you feel about that. But, right? So everything had to do with sex. Um, Bowlby, on the other hand, like, realizing that as Freud is analyzing people, he's always going back and pointing back to, like, what must have been going on in their childhood to make them act the way they're acting now. Um, so Bowlby says, well, I'm just going to study children and see what children do. And so he starts looking at children and the way that children relate to their parents. And he also is looking at some of the studies that were done during, um, during World War I, World War II, especially with Russian orphanages, where these children were abandoned and they were put in these orphanages. 
and there would be like hundreds of children in an orphanage, very few caregivers, and all they were doing was trying to meet the basic needs of the child. Like, let's make sure they're fed and they have a place to sleep. And many of those children died because of failure to thrive. And they realized that the reason that they died was because nobody ever touched them. Right? Nobody ever held them. So when we went through those like seven needs, seven desires of the human heart, that desire to be touched, there's actually a physiological medical explanation for that. Right? It's a physiological need that we have to be touched. And so those children didn't feel safe, secure, cared for, and they ended up dying and having failure to thrive. And so looking at children and the way they interacted with their parents, um, Bowlby comes up with these different styles of interaction or styles of attaching to one's parents. Right? And so the first style of attaching is a secure attachment. Right? And in a secure attachment, typically these were children who, when placed in a room with their parent, they would tend to like go out and explore the room. They play with their toys. Every once in a while, they look back to make sure their parents there. But knowing their parent was there, they'd continue to play, and everything would be fine. And they would use their parent as a base. So when they would go out and they'd start to feel a little anxious, or they start to feel like uh, something's a little bit wrong, what would they do? They'd run back to their parent, reconnect with their parent, and then go back out and explore again. And then there are insecure attachment styles. And when we look at insecure attachment styles, there's basically three different kinds of insecure attachment. Right? The first kind of insecure attachment is fearful attachment. We can also call that anxious attachment. In fearful or anxious attachment, there's like this kind of belief that I don't really know if I'm loved, right? Because we have to know we're loved in order to entrust ourselves. So I don't really know if mom's going to be here for me. And so I need to make sure that mom's going to be here for me, right? So the fearful attached person, they kind of want to control relationships and make sure this person's going to be there for them. And so this child would go into the room and they'd really not go very far from mom to explore. They'd want to stay right near mom all the time. And if mom left the room, they would cry and throw a temper tantrum. These are like kids who have separation anxiety. And when they leave their parent, they start acting out and throwing a fit because they're not really sure that this person's going to be there for them. Right? So it's kind of... People are untrustworthy, so I need to make sure that they meet my needs. The second kind of insecure attachment is avoidant. Right? The avoidant person, they basically say, people are untrustworthy, so I don't need people. Right? So the avoidant person, they might go into the room and just not even care that their mom's there. And they don't look back, and they don't go back, and they don't kind of circle back. And, and they're more likely as adults to want to isolate. They're likely as adults to not have a lot of friends. Um, they're not great conversationalists. Like they could go on an amazing vacation, and somebody says, how was your vacation? Good. <laughs> Why are you asking me? It was fine. Um, giving one syllable, syllable answers. They also tend not to ask for help. Right? Or not to ask for directions or not to read the directions. Like they're basically the person that says, I can do everything by myself. The third kind of insecure attachment style is the dismissive. Sorry. Yeah. Are these things learned or are they gained or ingrained? I'm going to cover that in a second. The question was, are they learned or ingrained? They're not like, I'll cover that in a second. Remind me to answer the question about temperament and attachment styles, OK? Um, dismissive is like, uh, I don't really think people care about me. And so I'm not going to put a lot of stock in that. But I also am not really avoidant or fearful. 
So they sort of care, but they don't care. These are people who they relate well, you know, they could relate well with you, but then if they like leave the room, they don't really think about the fact that you exist. Um, or maybe like they're people who move a lot. And so they might go to a place, they meet a lot of friends, they make good connections, and then they move and they don't maintain those relationships over time or distance. Um, it's like another example, they might be somebody who can share their life with somebody, but they don't really care whether or not you respond adequately. Okay, so there's this core belief that I don't matter, um, but I kind of get through my life and I can be fairly functional. Um, so these are three different kinds of attachment styles, right? There are three different, we can also call them three different ways that love is distorted, three different ways their identity is distorted. And they get distorted just through natural means. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video. And uh, this is called the Still Face Experiment from Dr. Ed Tronic. And uh, we'll watch this baby as they interact with their mom and kind of see what we come up with, whether it's ingrained or learned. Reactivity in the so Hang on a second. Uh, it's not going to give me. I'm going to have to put my microphone down here. Social interaction that they get from the good. There's no reparation. And, and they're stuck to go when people are. Okay, there we go. This young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I like oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. okay. 
So, any comments? Or what did you notice? Right, so when mom doesn't interact, it stresses the baby out. Um, what did you notice at the beginning between the mom and the baby? Right, they're mirroring each other, right? Because within like the field of neuroscience, right, there are mirror neurons in our brains, and that's what sort of makes us smile when somebody else is smile. It makes us sad when somebody else is sad. With children, they tend to do whatever they see their parent doing, right? And so there's a relationship and communication that goes on between the mother and the baby, right? Even before the baby can talk, before the baby's forming neural, like, verbal memories in their brain. And the baby has an experience of the mom. And so in the beginning, the mom's very attuned to meeting the baby's needs. Right? And then when the mom goes still face, like, how did that feel for you watching that? Sad. I heard angry. Hurt. Right? And how did the baby respond? Right? She tries to get the mom back. So the baby's even able to initiate communication with the mom. Right? And the baby's trying to tell the mom something even before they have verbal memories or they're able to form words, the baby's trying to tell the mom something. Like, the baby's trying to tell the mom, I need you. <laughs> like, I need to be affirmed in the world, right? I need all of those things that we talked about yesterday when we talked about what it means to be a son or a daughter, right? And so the infant asks for that right away. And the mom just remains still-faced. And then we see the baby do what? Cry, protest. What was the last thing the baby did? Screech. After the screech? Well, she, turned away. she turned away, right? Um, I'm going to just pull up. Let's see if I can find it. There. All right. What does that remind you of? That picture. Hmm. Hiding. Hiding. All right. Hiding. The baby's covering themselves. All right. What happens after original sin? Shame. Hiding. Covering oneself. Right? And so that thing, that, that story that we tell over and over and over again, that theological story about how after the fall, then they made clothes for themselves and they were hiding in the trees in the garden is lived out in all of our lives, even from that time. Right? Even as an infant, it's lived out in our lives. And so what do you think happens when there's a baby trying to get mom's attention? And mom's doing this. Like the same thing. Right? The same thing. Or the baby's trying to get dad's attention and dad's doing this. Or our students are trying to get our attention and we're doing this. You know, the same thing. I'm not being recognized. I don't have value. I don't matter. And so an attachment rupture happens just simply from this still face. Right? An attachment rupture doesn't have to happen because somebody was physically abused. It doesn't have to happen because uh, parents are divorced. It doesn't have to happen because of any of that stuff. It can happen simply by mom and dad don't respond to me. They don't respond to me the way I need to be responded to and when I need to be responded to. 
And so when we say God created the world and everything was good, then something happened. The thing that happened, it might just be that. And it's not always, I'm not saying like it's every mom's fault if their kid has an attachment wound. I'm not saying that um, because some of us, we start to feel guilty right away and we're like, oh my gosh, I've done that so many times, right? It's not every mom's fault, you know, but, but we have to recognize like these are where some of these things can come from, right? If mom has postpartum depression and she's got like her seventh kid, what do you think she looks like most of the time? Right? If, if mom's married to an alcoholic husband and she's trying to manage him all the time, what do you think she looks like most of the time? If there are other forms of addiction in the family, what do mom and dad look like most of the time? And... And so we can grow up with these attachment wounds. You know, a lot of the adults I work with, they have attachment wounds because they grew up with this. But then when we try to talk about that, it's like, no, no, my parents were great. And they really, I know that they loved me. And we always went to church on Sundays and we always did everything. But yeah, but they didn't like meet your need when you needed your needs to be met. And that's still a wound, even if it's an accidental wound. I said to somebody, I said to somebody the other day, I was like, what if like, I don't know. When I was a kid, we used to play Wonder Woman. That's part of my own confusion. But um, do you remember like 70s Wonder Woman, how she changed into Wonder Woman, right? And you spin around like this. I was like, what if I was playing Wonder Woman and I was spinning around like this and my sister walked within my like spinning and I clocked her in the face? Like, would it be my fault? No. Did I intend to do it? No. Does she still like have a broken nose? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to tell her, like, you don't have pain because it was an accident. Right? You don't have pain because, you know, it was just like a fluke thing. Like, you still have pain. And that pain still needs to be healed. And it matters that it gets healed. Right? It matters that it gets healed. And we can be dismissive of those kinds of identity wounds that happen in our life because, well, it, it wasn't really anybody's fault and I don't want to blame anyone. You know, it's not about parent blaming. There's a big parent blaming movement like in the 70s and the 80s. Um, it's not about parent blaming. It's just about recognizing I wasn't raised by the Holy Family of Nazareth. And so I probably have some kinds of wounds in my life that our Lord wants to heal and our Lord wants to give me what I didn't get. And I'm not going to let him give me what I didn't get unless I recognize that I have something to be, to receive. You know, we all have something to receive. St. Paul says, all have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. Like, we're all sinners, and we've all been sinned against, and our Lord came into the world to heal that, right? To heal that. And so, other things about the baby... Um, that I think are interesting, right? So the baby has no language, but does the baby have emotions? Yes. Yes. And how do we know about the baby's emotions? They act them out in their bodies, right? They act their emotions out in their bodies. And so I don't know how to express myself, and so I just, it, it like comes out in my body, right? Which also reinforces what the somatic experience that we talked about already, the fact that we're a body soul composite and the body expresses the person. And so without deciding I'm going to express myself through my body, a baby just naturally acts out their emotions in their body. Um, When I was in Phoenix last week, I went to see my grandmother, who's in the memory care unit at um, the nursing home complex. They're in one of those, like, mega complexes. They've been in it for 20 years where you go house, apartment, care center, memory care. So she's in memory care, and she comes out to see us, and you could just watch her like have this happy expression on her face when she first saw us and then she's sitting there and she kind of forgot who we were and why we were there and then she sees my grandfather and she's like how'd you get out (laughs) right because like she's not allowed out but he's obviously allowed out like they like they got out of jail you know like how'd you get out and um and then you just watch her struggle as I could tell that she wasn't remembering 
15 seconds ago. And she would almost start to cry, and then she would come back, and then she would like kind of lose herself, and then she would come back. Like what was happening? Like she doesn't have verbal memories right now from moment to moment, but does she have emotions? Yeah. And her emotions are getting acted out through her body, right? The same way that they get acted out in that baby. You know, and the difficulty in interacting with her was just like to respond to her in that moment. Because she was always like, I want to go home. And my grandfather's like, you are home. We've been here for, for 20 years. And he tries to explain to her logically, you know. She doesn't have any memories. Like, she just misses where she grew up. And I said, do you miss Michigan, Grandma? Oh, yes. I just kind of calmed down a little bit. You know, and she remembered who I was and when I left. No, she referred to me as like her little boy because I stayed with them a lot when my mother was sick. So our emotions get acted out in our bodies. Our emotions get acted out in our bodies. So when our students, especially at the lower grade levels, right, when they're throwing a tantrum or when they're acting out or when they're getting in trouble, they're communicating something of their emotional experience through their bodies but they lack emotional intelligence. Like, they don't know what they're feeling. They can't say, I feel frustrated because da 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 da. They're just kind of acting that out through their bodies. Right? And in some sense, like, this goes back to, um, and I'm just saying this for the sake of perspective. I'm not telling you, like, not to discipline your students. But just for perspective, it goes back to, like, obviously they're expressing that they have a need and they need attention. And so how can we give them attention in a way that's loving and merciful and also calling them to conversion at the same time? Because that's what they're asking for. Right? They're just like that child who feels misunderstood, who feels like something's wrong. You know, This always has worked in the past, but it's not working now. You know, they're just like that child. A lot of times we're like that child. You know, a lot of times we're like that child. Like when we have like those negative emotions that we don't want to feel and we just like go watch Netflix or whatever we do. Um, we're kind of like that baby, right? Like I don't know that I feel sad or that I feel alone because it's the anniversary of a death coming up or because um, I felt rejected earlier in the day and then I just go home and I act out my emotions through my body by going, uh, I don't really want to watch this show, but I'm going to watch it. Or an alcoholic who says, I don't really want to take this drink, but I'm going to drink it. And I'm not even thinking about the fact that I'm doing it. You know, addictions, they're really just working out attachment relationships that don't work like something didn't work for them and they're working it out so again this like child spouse parent model in neuroscience like in the way our brains are formed uh, this is a brain we'll call that a brain your brain stems down here and like your amygdala your midbrains about here and that's what in the good pictures bad pictures book we call your feeling brain which is in charge of emotional regulation. It's in charge of emotional regulation. And so when your brain was formed, it was formed in utero in your mom's body and it formed from the bottom to the top and from the right to the left. And so the parts of your brain that are in charge of your emotions were actually formed first. And as they were formed in the body of your mom, then that part of your brain sort of tuned itself to the body of the mom, right? Tuned itself to the body of the mom. So when this part of the brain says something's wrong, it sends out a distress signal. Like when there's emotional distress, it sends out a distress signal. And so the distress signal goes out and the baby cries. That's what the baby's doing there, sending out a distress call. And this person called mom comes. And when mom comes, everything's good. Right? Everything's good. 
and mom's able to regulate the baby again. So I think I already talked about like picking up my niece and she's like kicking me in the face and all of that. And then I gave it to her to her mom and she's all good. Um, my other niece, Bridget, when she was about two years old, I went to visit and I went up to her and I was like, hey, Bridget, how are you? How's it going? And she just looked at me like, huh? And then she like back up. Where's mom? <laughs> she went to her mom. She threw her arm around mom's leg and then she was able to like engage me. Interesting, right? Because what happened? There's a stranger here who seems like he knows me. He's acting like he knows me, but I have no idea who they are. And it's kind of freaking me out. So I'm my emotional center sending out a distress signal. So I need mom. Uh, I go find mom. It calms down my brain. And now I can interact with this person. Right? It's really amazing how God created us. And so when I have distress, I send out the call. Mom comes, calms me down. And so there's this feedback loop that goes between distress and mom that eventually becomes a neural pathway in the brain and an automatic response. So a child who's like four or five years old that falls down and scrapes their knee says, I want my mom. Right? It's an automatic response. And when that happens in the right times and the right ways, when there's good attunement, when there's repair, right? Dr. Tronic said, like, when there's repair, like that attachment rupture, there was a rupture, and then the mom like got the baby back, and the baby calmed down right away, and they were back interacting. So the, when there's good repair, um, this neural pathway forms in the brain and you have a securely attached person. But sometimes, as I said, mom comes and sometimes mom doesn't come. Sometimes mom had postpartum depression. Sometimes, like my mom died when I was two, so I had like an army of moms that took care of me when I was a kid. Um, sometimes it was a neighbor. Sometimes it was a lady that the parish asked to help our family. Sometimes it was my grandparents. Sometimes it was my aunt Sandy. And so I sort of grew up in, when I was in emotional distress, I probably had to scan the room for who's going to meet my needs. Like, who's here today? And okay, this person's here today. And so they're going to meet my needs. And then the next day, that person's not there. It's somebody else. So I got to scan the room. Okay, it's this person today. So they're going to meet my needs. And because that person wasn't there, this person's there, I'm just going to go to this person. So guess what kind of attachment style that I grew up with? Anybody? Dismissive, right? Dismissive. Like, I'm going to engage with you, and then if you're not there, I'm not going to worry about it because I have this person, and I'm not really going to count on you to be here because it's not really your job. It's only your job when you're here. Right? You meet my needs when you're here, but when you're not here, it's not your job to meet my needs. So I, to this day, I still have a hard time conceptualizing the reality that I have relatives all around the world who think about me when I'm not in front of them. Right? I just have a hard time. I know it's true in my cognitive brain. <laughs> I know it's true because they yell at me when I'm not in touch with them. And their anger reveals their love. But, but my heart like, still is trying, I'm still doing that work. Because I never knew that I had, that that was a problem. I just thought I was super adaptable. <clears throat> when I was in the army, that's how army people work. Army people go to a post, they meet friends, they make connections. Then they get PCS to another post. And then when they get to the next post, they forget about those friends. They still love them and care about them, but they're just not there. These people are here, so I'm going to be with these people. And then if they link up again in the future, they just pick up where they left off, and it's great. So I have army friends that if I'm traveling and I happen to be in a town where they live, they're like, oh, give me a call. We'll go to dinner. We'll go to the game. I was in Los Angeles. There was a guy. I don't even think I was really friends with him at West Point. And he just saw on my Facebook that I was in L.A., and he's like, do you want to go to the Lakers game? Um, wow, this is like really free friends. Um, <laughs> so that's how that worked. Right, so I grew up dismissive. Now, when there's an insecure attachment, right, addiction is more likely to occur. Right, why? Because I'm in this state of emotional dysregulation because I don't have a secure person that's always there for me. Then... 
I get a PlayStation. And my brain realizes when I play the PlayStation and I feel like I'm in that other world and I'm shooting all these dudes, um, my brain feels numb. Right? My brain kind of feels numb. It doesn't feel calmed down. It feels numb. But numb is better than dysregulated. Because at least numb can be consistent and I don't have to feel sad or lonely or angry or anything like that. And I realized that video games can help me when I'm in emotional dysregulation. <clears throat> and so my brain learns this. And then my brain starts to form a pathway between emotional dysregulation and video games. So much so that whenever I start to feel a little bit off or a little bit sad or like something's wrong, what do I want to do? Go play video games. And it becomes just as instinctive as the child who says, I want my mom. And so this neural pathway grows, and it becomes very strong. And I end up like playing video games without even really wanting to play video games. Or I could play video games for five hours, and the time just kind of goes by, and I don't even notice it's going by. And I start to regulate my emotions with a substance instead of a person. Right? Like that's what addiction is. Okay? And I'm not talking about like just really bad heroin addicts. Um, but the fact that many of our young people are being set up to be addicted to technology. Because if there's an adult who discovered one day that their phone makes them feel better, you know, and I'm trying to reteach my brain that my phone doesn't make me feel better. Because I think my phone makes me feel better. Because there was probably one day I was having a bad day, and I opened up my phone, and I went to my Facebook, and there was an old friend from a long time ago who just sent me a random message telling me that they really appreciated me, and they really thought I was a great guy, and they were affirming me. And I felt better, and I was like, oh, wow, like, that was amazing to connect with these people, and it brought back all these good feelings, and it made me feel happy when I was sad or lonely. So what did my brain learn? When I'm feeling sad or lonely, my phone can make me feel better. And so I pull it out whenever I'm feeling sad or lonely. What's going on? And I go to Facebook and, but then now what happens? Like I pull it out, I go to Facebook, there's nothing. I go to, so I go to email and there's nothing. And then I go to and my other email and there's nothing. And so then I go back to Facebook and there's still nothing. Like, have any of you ever done that? Like, you checked your email, and then you checked the social media, and you checked another email. And then before you put your phone away, you go back and check the first thing that you checked. You know there's nothing there. Like, as if the most amazing message would have come in in the last 10 seconds. <laughs> you know, I'm sure if I just check again, I'm going to get some kind of reward in my brain that's going to make me feel better. Right? That's called being an addict. Right? At a minimum, it's called trying to regulate my emotions through a device. Right? Trying to regulate my emotions through a device. A long time ago, we used to, when we felt lonely or we felt disconnected from people or we just felt like something was off or we felt stressed, we went to this thing with a cord on it and we picked it up and we dialed a number and we talked to a real person. And that person usually answered. And we talk to them, and after we talk to them, our brain regulated because we're supposed to regulate with relationships, not with things. And we felt better, and we hung up with the phone. And maybe, maybe we went to the phone, and uh, like when I was in college, whenever I felt like off as a freshman, like, oh, I can't even get any work done, I just feel like something's off, I would go downstairs and I'd stand in line until the pay phone opened up. And I'd go to the pay phone and I'd call home. And but maybe nobody was home. So what did I do? I called somebody else. And they were home, and I talked to them, and I felt better. Right? I kept calling until I could actually communicate with a person. Right? I kept calling until I could communicate with a person. Right? Our young people today, what they're doing is, and sometimes it's what we're doing as adults, 
I'm checking my email, there's nothing. I'm checking my Facebook, there's nothing. I'm checking my Instagram, there's nothing. I'm going to Snapchat, I send out something funny, nobody responds. Um, I just got rejected 20 times in the last three minutes, and so since nobody's answering me, I'm playing video games. And so there's not that feedback loop that comes through a natural real relationship. Right? And we do have grade school kids who are addicted to video games. Right? Probably more than we want to know. Because once in a while, I get that call from a parent. You know, I get those calls. Like, my kid saw pornography. What do I do? And then they come in, and then I start asking questions, and I find out this kid is playing video games like five hours a day. Like, more time on video games than in the world. And that's not recreation. That's... That's like life, and you know, when I interact with real people, that's like a break from life. And we wonder why you know, we live in this society that's lonelier and more isolated and unable to communicate or immature. They're still working their emotions out through their body because they don't know how to interpret them. Right, and so I use video games as an example, but we can always plug in any kind of thing. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, um, just being on the internet, just looking at a screen, any of those things. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's um, becoming a volunteer, right? Like over-volunteering in order to avoid my life. Um, Over-busyness in order to avoid my life. Um, we have to be aware of these things because they're distortions in love. And how do we repair them? How does it get repaired, right? I have to atrophy this pathway and build another one to real relationships with real people. Right? I have to learn how to have a relationship again. I have to learn to have a relationship again. You know, so again... Uh, I made reference to this the other day. Like, as you think about uh, how do I, how am I going to teach this theology of the body curriculum? How am I going to talk about these um, things like pornography, etc., etc., etc.? The Good Pictures, Bad Pictures book talks about feeling brain and thinking brain and getting your thinking brain to be in charge, right? And that really means my thinking brain is in charge of governing and listening to my feeling brain. So how does that work? Uh, I realize I want to play video games. And then my thinking brain says, wait, I know that when I want to play video games, it means I need to call a person. So I'm going to call a person. Right? It's how we relearn and becoming aware of the movements that are going on inside of us. Right? Are emotions good, bad, or neutral? How many say neutral? Raise your hands. Come on, raise them high. Good. I love class participation. It's getting so much better every day. Uh, bad. Nobody good. Few people say good. Right? I'm going to say good because God gave them to us. Right? But a lot of times we think they're bad and we don't trust them. Right? Our reason's job is our reason's job to be in control of our emotions. How many of you were ever told as a child, get your emotions under control? Stop crying on demand. Right? Our brain's not designed to control our emotions as a tyrant, but rather to listen to them and respond to them in a way that's appropriate. Right? St. Thomas Aquinas says that the reason has sort of monarchical control, monarchical rule over the emotions, which means like our reason's supposed to listen to our emotions, interpret them, figure out what's going on, and then respond to them in a way that's going to be virtuous. Because right? we can have lots of emotions, but we need to interpret them and respond in a virtuous way. When we try to control them, they always rebel. Just like if there's a tyrannical leader in a country, eventually the people rebel. 
and our emotions will rebel if we try to control them. Right? If I'm feeling sad, and I'm just like, don't feel sad. Feel this. Just be happy. We don't get sad in our home. Right? We don't get angry in our home. Those kind of things, they teach kids to not understand their emotions. Listening to them means, like, okay, I feel sad. I feel sad because my grandfather's really sick, and what do I need to do? I probably need to go visit him or call him on the phone or do whatever it is. So when somebody has these kinds of behaviors, like, I want to play video games all the time. What I really need is relationship. So what I know that when I want to play video games, I need a relationship. I'm going to make a phone call. Right? It's how 12-step groups work. Right? We've all seen movies. Somebody who wants, they're like on their way into a bar and they're staring at a glass of Jim Beam and then they pick up the phone and call their sponsor. Right? What's going on? They realize, because I want to drink alcohol, I know I'm in emotional distress and the real way to address my emotional distress is to call a person and talk to them. It's like learning a language. When I learned Italian, I had to look at that object over there and say, okay, that's a chair. And the word for chair in Italian is sedia, so that's a sedia. And then eventually, I didn't have to go through all those steps. And I was able to just go, sedia. Right? As people get healing, we want to teach them, like, when you're feeling that way, so the brain goes, I need a relationship. And we just start calling people automatically. Now, I always say to people who struggle with addiction, like, there was once a time in your life when you had the same emotion and you just like crawled up on your mom's lap and snuggled with her. That's what you did. And then somewhere along the line you learned that if you do something else, it'll take care of that need without your mom. I can take care of myself without God. Right? It all like, corresponds to the theology that we've been reflecting on. Okay? It all corresponds to the theology we've been reflecting on. Right? In order to develop a secure attachment, in order to like, move from these insecure styles to a secure style, what do we need? We need a secure, trustworthy person that we know wants the good for us. That's what we need. Okay? We're all called to be that in other people's lives. And in order to be that, we have to have received that from somebody. Right? So we have to learn to be a son or a daughter who's secure in our Lord in order to be secure for other people. Right? In order to be secure for other people. And, and the way that works itself out, sometimes it takes time. But it is possible to change. It's possible to change. There used to be somebody in my life who had this kind of attachment style. The very fearful, anxious attachment style. And so whenever this person was upset, they would send me these really long text messages, and then I wouldn't respond. Why didn't I respond? Because if I respond, then she's, this person's always going to feel like um, she's in control of the relationship. And she's never going to have the experience that I want the good for her because I just choose to. And so I wouldn't respond. And then I got a lot of text messages calling me bad names and um, telling me what a horrible person I was and what a horrible priest I was and because I didn't respond to her all the time. And then one day she walks into my office and she goes, okay, look, Father, I know you care about me. You don't have to respond to my messages. I just want your help. Like, what happened? Like, she learned that like, I actually cared about her regardless of whether or not she asked. And she became secure in that relationship. Right? And just a small example. You know, and so that's what good therapists know how to do is to help somebody to like, move into the secure quadrant. Right? If you're curious about your own attachment style, um, you can Google experiences in close relationships. Um, so the ECR is a test. Right? It stands for experience in close relationships. And there's a series of questions that they'll have you answer. And then it'll show you on a graph like where you fall. Like, are you dismissive, secure, uh, anxious, fearful, or avoidant? Right? And sometimes that's interesting to do just for ourselves. 
Um, a lot of times with spiritual directees, I, I really like, would want them to take that test, but to answer all the questions with regard to Jesus and to see where they are with Jesus. Because can we have a fearful attachment to Jesus? Yeah, fearful attachment to Jesus. It kind of looks like uh, I have to do all this stuff in order for Jesus to love me. And if I don't do all this stuff, he's not going to love me. And so if I miss like one Hail Mary out of my whole rosary, then like, oh, psh, he probably hates me now. <laughs> right? Happens. Uh, can we be avoidant with Jesus? Yes. All right? We can be avoidant with Jesus. Lots of people have an avoidant attachment to our Lord. I think most people who claim atheism probably just have avoidant attachment with our Lord. And we can also have a dismissive attachment to Jesus, which is like theism, where I believe that God created the world, but he doesn't really care about it. You know, and our attachment to Jesus, like guess where that finds its roots in our human experience, right? In the way that mom and dad responded to me or didn't respond to me. You know, and so there's a very human dimension to this theological system that John Paul II gave to us, right? Because it's just the way our brains work, and it's the way that our experience works, and it's the way that we form relationships, right? So going and studying it from a theological point of view, it gives us the perspective to say, like, there is a truth to the way we're supposed to be in relationship. Because you'll find plenty of people who will tell you that, like, your attachment style is completely arbitrary. And it's not good or bad to be secure or avoidant or fearful. It's just the way you are. From a theological point of view, that's not true. From a theological point of view, like, the goal is to be secure. Right? The goal is to be secure in our human relationships and in our relationship with our Lord. Right? And so these things are movable. Right? They're impacted by our environment. Um, they might be impacted somewhat by our disposition, right? Like if somebody is born with something like autism, right? They have an impediment, like a physiological impediment to forming close relationships. But just our attachment style is not something like that's permanent, right? Some people like temperament, you know, like four temperaments. Are you all familiar with the four temperaments? Right, I don't even know them off the top of my head because I get annoyed by it sometimes. Uh, it's like choleric, uh, sanguine, phlegmatic, and? Huh? Melancholic. Good. Um, so these four temperaments, they're four categories of people, right? And uh, so, but sometimes people use their temperament to, to like excuse bad behavior. You know, like, that person's always, like, gruff and mean. Well, I'm just choleric. God made me choleric. <laughs> um, and, and so, like, Jesus' temperament, what's Jesus' temperament? Right? It's the perfect balance of all four temperaments. Okay? When we really identify with one temperament over the other three, it means we're not integrated. And they move. You know, it's possible for them to move. Right? Like Myers-Briggs. How many of you have ever taken Myers-Briggs? Okay. It tells you your personality style. Do you get the same one every time you take the Myers-Briggs? No, not exactly, because it moves. Right? We give this sort of brief test on engaged encounter, and like Mr. Kapersky, when we're on that thing, I always retake it, and I always get different scores. Right? A lot of times I'm like kind of even across the board on these four characteristics, but once in a while, depending on what else is going on in my life, and how many attachment wounds I have that week, um, <laughs> what I come out at is different, right? What I come out at is different. Okay, and so, <clears throat> so that wraps up this sort of reflection on attachment and how it's related to the theology of the body and the theology that we're teaching. Um, also to kind of gain some perspective on um, where our students might be at. In, uh, in teaching. And so we will now take a break. Um, go ahead and take...
like 10 minutes. Yeah.